We're, we're thankful for everyone that has played a part in what we've been doing here as far as the painting and the cleaning and the new cross and all of the different things. I'm excited because God is actually really doing something here. Despite, despite what the world says, despite what the devil does, that God is still real and he's still moving. Amen. He's on the move, so I'm glad I'm on the right team. Glad I'm on the right team. And I'm actually glad to have Reverend and Sister Lloyd here. Amen. Same team. Different place. They're, they're pastoring down in Nashville. Nashville. And uh, we go down there sometimes to, to visit and have church with them. They do the same. But right now I'd like to have Reverend Lloyd stand and say a word for the Lord, please. First of all, it's good to be in the house of work tonight. And uh, I'm glad you said the time was 7.30. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, well, I didn't, I didn't tell Pastor Gray I'm coming, so if it throw us out, oh well. <laughs> uh, I showed up right before church starts, so you didn't get a chance to throw us out. <laughs> but we're glad to be in the house of the Lord and to be able to yes. know that God has been so good to us. Amen. And to see all these wonderful people worshiping God is a blessing. Amen. Amen. Yes, it's a blessing. And, and I appreciate um, Reverend Devonshire, Pastor Devonshire here. I was thinking, um, thinking maybe 20 years ago, uh, you know, he was he was my pastor in Jefferson City, Kansas, and here I'm getting a chance to come and have church with him again yeah. one more time. And that's the faithfulness of God that over the years, yes, amen. over the years, you know, we can still be on the same team, serving the same God, going to the same place and loving each other all the same. It's a blessing to be able amen. to to be able to, to know that's that's the way God is. Amen. 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 Yes, amen. yes and we're excited again. That we're not doing this alone. That y'all come and sometimes it's not as big as other services. But we're not in this fight alone. And we have teammates. We have people that have been doing it a lot longer. We have examples. They have experience. All of these different things. And I'm just thankful that we have them here tonight. And then also one more. We're going to hear from Reverend Devonshire here in a little while. But I'd like to have Sister stand and say a word for the Lord. Amen. I'm so excited to be here tonight to see everyone and everything. I just remember um, I was in the military in Hawaii so many years ago. I won't tell you how many. But um, that, and, um, I'm so thankful that God sent someone my way. Um, God saved me. He filled me with the Holy Ghost. Yes. Um, led me to an old-fashioned altar where I could surrender everything. And my life was never the same. Um, I didn't know, I didn't grow up going to church. I didn't know about Jesus. It just changed my whole life. And I'm just like amazed. I said, this is what I was looking for. I was stationed in Hawaii. You know, they have actors and make movies there. And oh, that's paradise. But I said, you know, this is not paradise. I live here. Some, you know, there's got to be something more. Mm -hmm. And when I met Jesus, when God got my attention, I said, that is what I was looking for. You know, yes. His spirit within me. And I'm just so thankful that he knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing tonight. It's not by accident, you know, that we're here. And you know, he has the hairs of our head numbered. You know, we don't even know that about ourselves. It just goes to show he knows more about us than we know about ourselves. And that's, um, he knows what we need more than we know what we need for ourselves. And that's why he sends people our way and sends us his holy word. So we have that more excellent way of living. Amen. 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 Yes, man. That's awesome. It really is. It really is to know that there's lighthouses all over this world. Yes. Beacons of hope for people just like us. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm happy. We're going to move on with the service and have Reverend Liverock come help us with the tithes and offerings. Just know that the offering tonight will go to our guest speaker. They're doing a travel here through Kentucky. Let's bless the man of God and allow God to bless you in return. Amen. Go ahead and praise Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this time in our service. We pray now and ask that you bless the gift and the giver, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
cheerfully, cheerfully is unto the Lord. And we know that God richly blesses us for what we do for him. So right now, my sister DeRay is getting ready to sing.
So he knows when you're paying attention and when you're not. So does the Lord. So give him your undivided attention, really, because that's what it's all about. That's why we're here. That's why we're here, to get a word from the Lord. God bless you, sir. Praise the Lord. Good to be in church tonight, amen? Amen. And for everybody here, we really appreciate Pastor and Sister Gray. Amen. They say, if you love the Master, you love your pastor, amen? Amen. amen? So we encourage you to take care of your pastor and pastor's wife. Be good yes. to them. Thank you very much for your giving. We do appreciate it. We're going to turn around and give it back to the local church and uh, thank you for thinking about us. And we really yes. do appreciate it. Glad to see all the updates, good things happening around here. Yes. And uh, I've been watching. New folks have been coming. And uh, you know, Reverend Lloyd was talking about how much of a blessing it is to see people continue on. And it's good. Uh, last time I came, I was just passing through by myself because I have a son who's in school and my wife was there watching. So this time she gets to come through with me and I get to see some of the brothers we saw last time continuing yeah. on, soldiering on yeah. for the Lord. Yeah. And that's a blessing. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. We do appreciate that and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has for us tonight. I know I've got something from the Lord. He laid it on my heart. Let me share with you, see if I can get you smiling. <laughs> this dude died and he had a $50,000 uh, policy money that he left to his sister to take care of the funeral. And so his brother was asking about that money and said, I uh, kind of wonder where all that money went. And she said, well, it was about $6,500 for the funeral, all the expenses. And then it was about $500 we gave to the preacher to do the ceremony. And he's saying, well, that's about $43,000. And she said, well, I bought a memorial stone. A memorial stone, $43,000? How big was it? She said, about seven and a half carats. <laughs> uh, good to be in church. Everybody here tonight. We passed her out of... Uh, St. Louis, Missouri, if you're ever in the area, come on by and see us, and uh, every week out of the month or so, we travel through the region to kind of uh, see if we can encourage some of the folks here, and so we're so glad you're here with us, and we encourage you to come be with us sometime in St. Louis. Conference is right around the corner, and that'll be in Missouri, and hopefully you can come be with us. I want to read to you two portions of scripture, the book of Joshua and 1 Kings. Joshua chapter 10, beginning in verse 16. But these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at Makeda. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings are found hid in a cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set men by it for to keep them. We're on the portion of the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. Verse 9, And he came thither unto a cave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? I want to preach to you tonight with the help of God in a message entitled, Getting Out of Your Cave. Getting Out of Your Cave. Let us pray. Pastor, would you please pray over our message and messenger. Lord, we thank you for this time to be here in service tonight. Lord, I thank you for everyone that's here. God, I pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds to receive of your word tonight. I pray that you bless Reverend Devonshire as he ministers your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I know how sometimes your mind gets uh, thinking on a fact, and if you wonder, well, hey, preacher, you got your wife here, and you said that you couldn't, uh, she couldn't come last time because of your son. What happened to him? Uh, he's, he's working, uh, doing some construction through the summer, trying to make a little bit of, of money, and that uh, he would uh, probably like to be here instead of working in that hot sun, but he likes getting paid too, amen? So <laughs> that's where he's at, and, and uh, being taken good care of, so rest assured, we didn't forget about him, amen? <laughs> Caves! A place where both animals and Human beings sometimes find a temporary place of shelter. A place you can go into when it's raining on the outside and maybe find a place where it will be dry. A place where you might find shelter from a storm or shade from the sun or a 
cool place to escape the sweltering heat, especially for the next two weeks. Amen? <laughs> but they are not meant to be permanent dwellings. They have their negative traits. If you've ever been in a cave, it can be damp. It can stink. If you go into a cave, if you plan to sleep there, you better find out if there's anything else in the cave. All right. <laughs> you might wake up being lunch for some critter. I had a, a brother one time. Maybe brother could do this. Brother boy may remember him. He was in. Uh, he was a rodeo fella in the, the church there at Fort Riley. Mm -hmm. He always wear these great big belt buckles, and uh, he was quiet, super super quiet. But every now and then we get him to talk, and he was sharing one day, he came in, he said, uh, I was asking him, he said, you know, one day I walked into my bedroom, and I found a snake had molted its skin and left it there in the bedroom. I said, what? I said, what did you do? I said, did you tear around the bedroom looking for that snake? He said, no. I said, man, I'm not making sleep there, no, there's a snake in the room. <laughs> He said, and one night I woke up, like I said, this is a rodeo type guy. He said, I woke up and I felt this weight on my chest. I said, what? I'm on the edge of my seat, right? He's on me, didn't think he's getting ready to tell me. I said, what did you do? He said, I looked up and there was this snake. And I'm thinking, he grabbed it and bit its head off. You know, did something. I said, well, what did you do? He said, I slowly put my head back down on the pillow and went to sleep. I said, you're crazy, man. How can you go to sleep with a snake on your chest? Well, if you were in a cave and you were laying down for rest, you better make sure there aren't any critters in that cave. Amen? And spiritually, people have caves. Sometimes it's a geography, a place they go to get away from it. Sometimes it's just an attitude. Maybe they've been hurt. And so instead of keeping their spiritual doors and their relational doors open, they close them off. But there's a problem with that. You might not get hurt anymore, but you can't get helped either. <laughs> Caves were not meant to be permanent places. Some have a cave in their mind. Some might run home to mom or run away to escape the responsibility. But you see, caves are dark places where negatives are developed. Dark places where negatives are developed. And if you stay in a cave long enough, things can happen. I read to you in the book of Joshua how that these, these enemies, they were hiding in a cave. They went into a cave to escape from the Israelites who were uh, going across and just defeating all of these uh, uh, armies. And these guys uh, slid into this cave. And they came and told Joshua about it. So what did Joshua do? He said, get some big stones and roll them in front of that cave's mouth. And so that cave, which was meant to be a temporary place, then became a prison. You see, when you run from your responsibilities, whether it's in your mind or whether it's geographically, sometimes you've got to be careful because if you stay there too long, it might become a prison. It might become a place where you can't easily escape. First time a cave is mentioned in the Bible was when Lot was fleeing from Sodom and Gomorrah. And as, thinking of the other fellow that come in, and as they were fleeing, his wife, yeah, a lot, his wife looked back, she turned into a pillar of salt, he was scared to death because of the fire and brimstone coming down on the city, and he said, listen, talk, talk to the angels, let me just go to this little city called Zoar. And when they went there, they went into a cave. Now, if you know the story, I really don't want to get into it. It was just Lot and his two daughters, and they thought, without to see all of this fire and brimstone, they thought the end of the world came down. There wasn't any more men, everything was done. You see, that's what happens when you get into a cave sometimes. You go in there because you're afraid. You don't think right when you're in a cave. You can't see the whole picture when you're in a cave. You still with me? You make bad decisions 
when you're in the cave. He had limited vision. And they made some bad decisions. Read about it if you want. Scripture tells us in Proverbs chapter 11, he said, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So sometimes we run into a cave because we're afraid. And when we get in there and we think everything's good, but there's a problem. We're cut off from everybody else. And solitude is good. It's always good to get alone, spend time with God, get alone and read your word, have your batteries charged. But God didn't intend for solitude to be permanent. Because once our batteries are charged, we're supposed to get out there and love people and minister to folks and, and interact with folks. And you can't be a Christian out on an island somewhere because God called us to interact. Yes, sir. How can you love somebody if you don't spend any time with them? Right. Yes, and the, here's the deal. You know, we all think we're pretty spiritual when we're by ourselves. <laughs> but you only learn to love when you have to deal with hard-headed people. Yes, be honest. Amen. When you're dealing with people that are difficult, that are socially awkward, that are just uh, hard to get along with, and you, because you're a Christian, you're trying to help them, and you're putting yourself there, and you're just kind of, you're learning how to love. And all of a sudden you say, man, maybe I'm not as lovely as I thought I was, because this is hard. <laughs> when you put yourself in a cave and you run away because of fear, you cut yourself off from others. When you enter your spiritual cave, there's no one to challenge your spiritual thought patterns. People start to think weird when they're all by themselves. They get some thought in their mind and they say, oh, the past is against me and this is going on, that's going on. And so they isolate themselves off in the barracks somewhere, off in their home somewhere, and they don't come around where God is able to break those thought patterns and challenge them. Yes. You see, when you enter your spiritual cave, there's no one to challenge your thought patterns. But when you come to church, you begin to hear what God says about your situation. Right. And more than you need to hear what Pastor Gray says, but he's going to tell you what God says. Right. More than you need to hear what the brother says or the sister says or what I say. You need to know what God says yeah. because he created you. And since he created you, he knows how to deal with you. He knows how to fix what's wrong. He knows how to help you. He knows how to straighten things out. He knows the best. And usually, you know, whenever they find some serial killer and they start going back into his past, what are one of the things that they usually say? He was a loner. Right? He was a loner. He was off by himself somewhere, had all those thoughts coming to him, and then decided to act on them. Don't be a loner. Don't be a, a barracks rat. Be around the brothers. Be around the sisters. Amen. When you're in a battle, spend time praying. Spend time in the Word of God. And then get around the pastor. Get around the brothers. Get around the sisters. Don't isolate yourself. You'll become better because you did. That was the first cave. I got a couple other caves. I got some good stuff to share with you. There was a time where David, who was... Uh, eventually going to be the king over Israel was in a cave. The Bible said that the man that he was serving, Saul, kind of went crazy, started to attack David. And David, instead of staying there, and you have to look at this, God had protected David over 21 times where Saul was trying to kill David. Now, two things can happen. You can say, man, I'm bulletproof. Because God keeps protecting me every time Saul's throwing javelins at me and trying to send men to catch me in my sleep to, to arrest me and do all these things. God has pr protected me every single time. That's one way to think. That would have been the right way. But the other way to think is this. Man, he keeps trying to kill me. One of these days he's going to do it. <laughs> so I better get out of Dodge. Well, that's giving up on, on what God had said. And David did that. And we, we go from David being bulletproof, seemingly uh, untouchable because God was watching over him, to David going up to the enemy king. And when he got there, he gets afraid and starts pretending like he's a crazy man, spitting on his beard and pretending like he's lost his mind. So the king says, what's this guy? He's crazy. I don't want him here. And then David fled from that place to where? Can you guess? A cave. A 
cave, the cave of Adullam. And check this out. When he was down there, you know who started coming around him? It wasn't, it wasn't uh, the A-listers of society. The Bible said everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented, are you still here? Everyone that was distressed, you see, oftentimes when you get into your little cave mentally or your cave spiritually, you begin to attract other people in a mess too. They're all looking for a venue to complain about things and talk bad about how this sergeant's so bad and I can't stand this place. You know, my wife was talking about Hawaii and then she served as a soldier there and then eventually we went back and pastored there some years ago. And so, you know, uh, people would get there. Uh, sometimes you hear the story. They got orders. I'm going to Hawaii. I'm going to Hawaii. <laughs> Man, I'm going to have one of them grass skirts and drink a little, drink a little uh, umbrellas from them. And I, now I'm going to be in Hawaii. I can't wait to get to Hawaii. And you see them there. After about two or three weeks, they're walking around. I can't stand this place. I'm stuck on this rock in the middle of the ocean. It's so expensive to fly home. When you're in a cave, when you're messed up, you attract other people that are that way. Yes, sir. But there was something that happened in the cave that was different. There was something that David did that was different than the other one. You can read about it in two different psalms. Psalm 57, listen to what the Bible said. David was a songwriter. And so he writes, to the chief musician, Altashith, Midtown of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave. And so the Bible's telling us this one was written when he was in the cave. What did he say? He said, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me. For my soul trusted in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. What was he saying? He's saying, these guys can't protect me. This cave can't be a permanent place. I've got to do something to get out of this situation. What did he begin to do? He began to pray. He began to cry out to God. Listen to him as he says in Psalm 142. He said a prayer when he was in the cave. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. Number one, it's not bad to pour out your complaint. But why pour it out to a guy that can't help you? All right, sir. Why tell somebody else? Why don't you pour it out to God who can do something about it? Yeah. Why just mur murmur and grumble and complain and you get somebody else murmuring and grumbling and complaining? But David said, I want to pour it out to the one that can do something yeah. about it. Yeah. He said, I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walk, had they privily laid a snare, a trap for me. Listen to this. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. I couldn't find anybody that would protect me there. I couldn't trust these guys. I, this cave isn't going to protect me. Listen to what he goes on to say. No man cared for my soul. Then he said, I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. You remember what I said? You go into a cave as a temporary place when you're afraid, and then something happens to try to make it a permanent place. They roll with stones to try to make it a prison. That's what they did with Joshua in Joshua's time. And David saying, man, you brought me out of my prison. Yeah. You see, here's what happens. We get into a cave and we think, man, nobody, nobody has gone through what I'm going through. Right. Man, this is such a big battle. I'm dealing with things the preacher doesn't know about it. Look at them, man, they're all goody-goody folks. They've never gone through what I've gone through. And I've got this past, and I've got this record, and I've got these things going on, and it's difficult, and nobody can understand. And you get locked into that prison in your mind. And maybe you start telling everybody else, and it just gets worse, and they're saying, yeah, man, I went through that.
that too. And I couldn't find a way out. I had to go back to the old life uh, to start making money again. I had to go back to the old white life. The old wife. <laughs> that would be good to it. this. Anyhow, I had to go back. But David said, no, I cried unto the Lord. He brought me out of my prison. Yeah. I'm so glad. I cried unto God. He brought me out. Yeah. When I was a young soldier, 19 years old, came close to dying, drinking and drugging and doing the wrong things, and I cried out unto God. And God came into my life and saved me. That was the last beer I drank, the last drugs I did, the last liquor I drank. Why? Because God is a God that can save us. He can transform yeah. us. He can make us new. Brother, we don't need a 12 step program. Just one prayer out of your cave, calling on God, saying, God, deliver me. And there's a God, a great big God that can reach way down and lift you up and make you clean and pure again. You got to get out of your cave, though. Some are in a cave spiritually because of sin. Others get into a cave spiritually because of fear and doubt. They end up there, as I read to you in the book of 1 Kings, when Elijah had run from Ahab and Jezebel. And he got up there to a cave, and God came out to him and said, Hey, what are you doing here? Why are you out here? I'm afraid that's why he was out there. And, and Elijah, if you read the Bible, God turns him around and sends him back, but his ministry was never the same again. From that time, God gave him, he said, you go anoint the other prophet, he's going to take your place. You go anoint this guy to be king. But never quite the same again. Kind of a sad deal. What are you doing out here, Elijah? Sometimes we end up in a cave because of fear. And the cave becomes a prison. Now, let me share with you one more thing that happened. When Joshua came back and he had those enemies locked in that, that cave, they rolled the stone out. They brought the enemies out. They killed him. And then the cave became their grave. Mm. They threw them in there and buried them there. You see, we run to a temporary place to find shelter, but God didn't intend for us to stay there. We're supposed to find shelter in Christ, Amen. refuge in Him. Yeah. And if we doubt and we stay there, the enemy tries to put all these doubts and fears, rolling these yeah. stones to keep us there. You still with me? Yeah. I'll keep my eye on it too. <laughs> I come traveling down there doing this flip to pray for him. Anyway. <laughs> but then if you stay in there, the prison becomes a grave. If you don't get out of it, it'll kill you. You see, doubt and fear is just a spiral down and down. Yes. Down, down. Let me share some other things. What gets us in the cave? Fear, doubts. When we were in Fort Riley, there was a brother who came to me one night. He said, he said, Pastor, this is just too much. I'm tired of fighting. As if there's an alternative. If you're on the battlefield and you're tired of fighting and you stop fighting, what happens? You either get killed or you become a prisoner of war. Right. If that's the alternative, keep fighting. Right. Amen? Yeah. Keep fighting. I mean, the alternative is not a good thing. I'm tired of fighting. People end up in a, in a cave because of doubts, fears. They're tired of fighting. The devil tries to keep them there. But I want you to notice something. He couldn't keep Jesus in the cave. Right. Yeah. I want you to notice something. Right. When Jesus came in the scene, he emptied caves. Right. When Jesus stepped in the situation, he Come began to pull people out of yeah. caves. Yeah. You read about Lazarus, his friend. They had buried him and they put him in a cave, rolled the stone in front of uh, the cave. But when Jesus came there, he said, get that stone out of there. And he stood right. there and he said, Lazarus. Come forth. Yeah. One man said he had to say Lazarus because if he didn't say Lazarus, if he just said come forth, everybody in all of those caves would have come out there. There would have been an army of people risen from the dead. But what was Jesus doing? He was saying, I don't want you to be in that cave, brother. That's what Christ did when he came to this earth. He said he doesn't want you to stay in sin. He doesn't want you to stay in addiction. He doesn't want you to stay with a cursed, filthy mind. He doesn't want you that way. He wants you to be clean. And I'm here to tell you, God can change you. God can save you. God can fill you with the Holy Ghost. God can rescue you. Amen. You don't have to stay that way. Two great dangers. The hiding place becomes a prison. And 
becomes a grave. But Jesus came and empty the graves when he shows up. He called Lazarus out. She doesn't like this message. <laughs> I'm sorry, baby. Next time I'll preach something different. Amen. <laughs> One little person, they were they were in church and the mom had to take them out. And the little boy, I think it was, and they threw the little boy over her shoulder as she was going out. Some little frustrated, right? And the little, the little boy knew what was getting ready to happen. And he looked out at the congregation and he said, pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> he knew it wasn't getting rid of me. I'm a nice talking to him. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus entered the cave at Lazarus' tomb and raised him from the dead. But the greatest, the greatest of all yeah. was when they buried Jesus. Yeah. And they rolled the stone there. Yeah. And even the enemies yeah. came. They, even the enemies remembered. We, we heard him say that he was going to come out. That this deceiver said that. Give us some, some soldiers so that we can make this sure. And the soldiers came and, and they sealed it up real tight so that nothing could get out there. And, and then Reverend Keck was talking a little bit about this the other day. And he said that, but when that day came and, and Jesus, and I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have been there. I mean, can you imagine when Jesus came out? Now, we know the spirit of life moved upon his body and came into him. And from that tomb, there must have been light that began to shine forth. And whether it was a, uh, the power of God or an angel that rolled the stone away, we know he came out. What happened that day? Did every tree bow down and praise to the God, the King of Kings and the Savior? Did the blades of grass bow down? Did the, the very birds and the begin to praise God because Jesus was alive again. Hell couldn't hold him. The devil couldn't defeat him. What happened that day? Did the very wind sing his praises? Did the very animals begin to say, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. All we know was the devil and the, the world couldn't keep him down. He rose from the dead and he specializes in raising men and women from their spiritual graves. Of death and in hell, of, of keys of death and hell. Yeah. Your marriage doesn't have to be in a cave yeah. of past hurt. You don't have to dwell in a cave of anger and bitterness. He's saying, Come out of that cave so you can be healed from the pain of the past. You see, the power of a church is the power of an empty cave, an empty tomb. Amen. Jesus. By God, by the Holy Spirit, moved upon him and brought him back to life. Now I'm almost done. Now if you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, what do I need to know? If you've never been saved, you've never been born again, you need to know that every man that's born into this life is born in sin. And there has to be something to take away that sin. Now you can look back at your past and say, that's way back when and that happened there and so on and so forth. But if you didn't do anything, that sin didn't go away. It's like dirty laundry. You can put it under your bed and keep it there for five months. You come back, it's still dirty. Keep it there for 10 years, it's still dirty. It's not going to get clean unless you wash it. Amen? Yeah. Our sin doesn't go away just by time. It needs to be washed. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, the idea that Jesus came down, he was innocent, he died on the cross, and he went to hell to take my place to pay for my sins and your sins, but it won't do you any good until you come to him and say, I'm tired of being in this cave. I'm tired of thinking about taking my own life. I'm tired of thinking about there is no hope. Jesus, come into my life, forgive me and save me, and God will bend the heavens, come down, give you a brand new beginning, and start a fresh start in your life. But if you're a Christian and you find yourself in a cave, the same thing that happened with Jesus, that spirit of life hovering over his body 
And then came in there. And brother, one of the best things that ever happened to you is to get along with God and let the Holy Ghost fill you. Amen. And the Spirit of yeah. God come into your life and raise you up. And you'll get up saying, man, why was I discouraged? Why did I think that there was no hope? Why? Because God filled me with the Holy Ghost and gave me a reason and understanding that I can make it. I can go forward in Him. I'm getting ready to stop. Get ready, musicians. Is it a time to get out of your cave? You can kick yourself and feel bad about it. You can turn around and say, uh, try to uh, listen to the lies of the devil, all the stones he throws in front of your cave. Or you can say, wait a second, Jesus came to give me a way out of this. Yeah. And what do I have to do once I know that I've sinned? Just come to him and say, Jesus, forgive me. Yes. Come into my life and save yes. me. 30-some years ago, I did that on the side of the highway. Wasn't even in a church. Didn't know a whole lot about anything, but I knew that if I died at that moment, I was going to die and split hell wide open. Didn't have a whole lot of background about church. I just knew there was a God. And I cried unto that God. He came into my life and saved me. That's what he wants to do in your life. You don't know him as Lord and Savior. How can I do that? Well, in just a moment, when we come to this altar, you can ask him, Jesus, I know I've sinned. Forgive me, save me, come into my life, yeah. and God will give you a brand new beginning. With heads bowed, and eyes closed, and the pastor comes. What do you need tonight? He preached about that life that Christ can give you. He preached about that power that can take you out of your sin. Right now, I invite you to come to this altar. Because if that same power that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he is able to make you alive. Come on tonight. Come on, I invite you. Don't be scared. Don't be shy. Don't worry about what your neighbor's going to think. He probably needs to pray to. So come on. Come on right down to this altar. We all need to pray. Come on. Don't be shy. God will deal with hearts today. Oh, wow. 
Wayward words 
still loves you. God still cares and he wants the best for you. Just remember that. If you're ever in a slump, if you're ever in a cave, you can get out. You can. He has made a way for you to get out. He has made a way to set you free. And it's awesome. So in saying all of that, saying all of that, we want you to go with God. So we go from here as we take it out to the workplace, take it out into the community. Go with God. Allow Him to order your steps. Allow Him to lead you and guide you into that truth that we all should be in. And then also we have a prayer meeting tomorrow night, 7.30, right here. Yeah. Want to come? We'd love for you to be here with the family. As He said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, yeah. there He'll be in the midst, yes. wanting to do a work in your heart and in your life. Yeah. And Thursday night, Right here, get another charge up, get another oomph to finish out the week so we can go into the weekend strong, inviting and reaching, reaching this community for the Lord. Amen. So we have fellowship next door. We want everyone to come. She's made an awesome spread. There's stuff for everybody, I think. I think. So let's do that. Let's go with God and allow Him to go with you. Let's close in prayer. Right? Love Rock, sir. Close the prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for the privilege, Lord, to be in this house tonight. We thank you, Lord, God, for the word that was brought forth. We pray, God, that each and every one has taken hold of the word and allowed your Holy Spirit to deal with their hearts. Lord, strengthen us that we may continue to come and receive more of your precious word. And we will continue to give you all the thanks and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.